reaching from way down here. Yeah. 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 From way down here. Welcome to Thread, a podcast designed to explore God's story and lead you into a full life in Christ. Thank you for joining us in this conversation, co-hosted by myself, Hannah D'Souza, and Dr. David Pochter. So hello everyone and welcome back to Thread. Uh, last week we talked about story and the importance of story. And this week's episode is all about spirituality, which is definitely Dave's wheelhouse. Um, So Dave, you just finished getting your PhD in spirituality. So how would you help us and everyone listening to understand what we mean by spirituality on thread? Yeah, so so one of the funny things that happened when we started this program was we used to joke about you know that song, 99 Bottles of Beer mm-hmm. on the Wall? Oh, yeah. You ever hear that song? Do you have that we song do. in England? You do. I made it over. <laughs> we, used to, we used to have a joke about how many definitions of spirituality there were, and there are a lot. We'll, we'll get into some of those today, but um, it, it's certainly a topic that needs some definition and some framework, and hopefully today we can help give that some guidance. So... You know, the terms used a lot, I'm sure you hear it a lot. I'm sure at Harvard, as a student, you hear mm-hmm. it a lot when you hear people talk about spirituality. What are the contexts that you hear it in? Yeah, I think when you describe someone as spiritual, I think it often means kind of in touch with God, with kind of the spiritual nature. Um, it's a positive term, overwhelmingly. I think I've heard, even starting this program, and I hear people describe themselves as spiritual, but not religious and spiritual seemingly being, yes, I'm in touch with kind of um, with God and with a higher power, but I'm not a fan of religion or institutions. Yeah, that gives us actually a good starting point for this. So that concept that you just talked about, spiritual but not religious or SBNR, there's another one, SBNI, spiritual but not institutional. Um, they're helpful because it it places a good emphasis on the presence of God and the relationship with God that I think some people had felt lacking in traditional religious contexts. I think when you say spiritual but not religious, it can also lose some of the value of what spirituality is. And so I think it will be good for us to really process this. So how can those how can those concepts be helpful? and how maybe misleading. So maybe we'll start with some different ways of thinking about spirituality. And there are a lot of definitions. There's a lot of scholars that have tried to frame this. So we could think about spirituality as how we live, as opposed to how we think. So theology would be how we think. How do we think about God? How do we think about the church? How do we think about the spirit? How do we think about, you know, salvation? Those are those all encompass theology. Spirituality would be then how we live, our posture, our motivation, our guiding ethos in life, how we are practicing our faith. So that would be spirituality in that that way of thinking about it. Or we could think about spirituality as experience, how we process everything, including God and others and our life and our path. So spirituality is sometimes defined that way as as our experience. Um, My mentor uh, defined spirituality as what we do with our eros, our God-given passion, how we act out and channel our natural energy. So in other words, we're all thrust into this world with this God-given energy for life that we see in an infant in the moment they come out of the womb. And that eros, that passion, and how we choose to channel it will define our spirituality. Um, we can think of spirituality also as mysticism. And I know this is mysticism's kind of a word that maybe scares people. They don't know what to do with it or how to think about it. Uh, when I talk about mysticism here, I mean the idea of preparing for, being conscious of, and reacting to the immediate presence of God. So 
So how do we experience God? How do we prepare to experience God? How do we act in in connection to that experience of God? That's what we mean here by mysticism. So spirituality in that sense of how do we how do we process the fact that God is present in our life? Maybe that would be the simplest way of talking about spirituality as mysticism. Spirituality can also kind of be talked about as how we are in the world, our sense of being in the world. In other words, how do we integrate and embody a whole way of living that seeks transcendence? And transcendence, you know, again, a a word that maybe we don't use too often, but it's important. Transcendence is this idea that we are pursuing something greater than ourselves. We know there's more to this created universe than just us in this space. So that's some basic definitions. There's an analogy that I really like that I think is helpful um, for our sports fans out there. Um, do you watch any sports, I by the should. way, Hannah? Are you well, football is big in our house, but you I should more? lost. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I I I'm I'm an occasional sports fan, but but most people understand sports well enough to understand this this analogy. So if we were to think about any game, football, football, right? Football, soccer, as the Americans call it, theology would be in that analogy, the rules to the game. So we have to have rules, right? We have to have a set time the game is played and we have to have boundaries about where the game is played and what kind of ball is regulation and how the players engage one another. All that, the rules to the game is our theology. The way we play the game, the game itself is our spirituality. And I think that's a really good analogy. So when we think about Christianity, if we were to use that analogy, Our theology would be the rules to our engagement. What is Christianity about as far as how we think about it? And then how we play it, our discipleship, the way that we engage the world, our sense of being in the world, that would be the game, right? So those are just some entry level, maybe ways of, or ways into this conversation that we can start with Mm. today. So hearing you list all those definitions, it feels like spirituality basically encompasses everything. Um, When you were speaking, actually, it reminded me of a quote I read. I can't remember exactly who said it, but they talked about us being not human beings having a spiritual experience, but we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And actually the soul, I guess, and the spirit is the more real even part of us. Well, I, I think you're right. It, it, is, it does try to encompass everything. Spirituality does speak to all the important aspects of the way we engage the world. So you're right. It, it is all-encompassing. But it helps us to think about things that we don't normally frame in our, in our spiritual experience, meaning in church life, at least in the traditions that I know you and I are part of, we often neglect certain aspects of our spirituality because we narrowly focus on other things. And so part of maturing is understanding the complexity of all these pieces that plays into. So again, for those online or for those who are watching us online, you'll see the slide that I'm going to put up and we'll talk through this. But I think this slide really helps to even look at six basic things that walk through spirituality that do define the whole over encompassing thing you're talking about, Hannah. So number one, spirituality talks about how we understand God. Second, it talks about how we understand ourselves as human beings, our nature and our condition. It, number three, talks about how we understand then our intimacy or union with or connection to or path to God in that. So when we understand God and we understand ourselves, it then leads us to how do we engage and understand our relationship with God? Number four, it helps us to understand and communicate what kinds of experiences lead us on this advancement, the spiritual advancement. So if spirituality really is about a transcendence, an experience of something bigger than us that gives meaning to life, how are we to understand and communicate those experiences that lead us that way? Number five, and this is the part that often gets left behind in the SBNR or spiritual but not institutional 
concepts, which is important, is how do we integrate with a community that shares on the journey? Community is so critical to our spirituality, who we're journeying with. And so I think that's also important that we include that. And then lastly, number six, how do we live according to a value system that guides us on that journey? So what is it about our practices, our engagement, what we do with our life, and how that shapes this process on this journey of transcendence in intimacy with God? So in other words, this is spirituality really is about our life as God works within us, right? So this could be seen all over scripture then, um, whether it's our life in Christ, um, life in the spirit, life in the kingdom or the church, um, discipleship, uh, I guess all those relationships show our spirituality. Right. So when we talk about our spirituality, we are talking about life in God, life in Christ, life in the spirit. You're right. That's absolutely right. Now, it's important to distinguish that this calling to this life is different than the world around us experiences. Christian spirituality calls us to a completely different experience. Paul, in in his letters to Corinth, um, addresses this in multiple places, in multiple ways. Actually, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the whole chapter is just a brilliant insight into spirituality, what it is. Um, but these, these three verses in particular, Hannah, maybe you could read these verses 12 to 14 for us, I think are really a good capturing of maybe even the mystical nature of Christian spirituality. Mm-hmm. You want to read those for us? What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the spirit. So Paul here is actually describing something in contrast to something else. A person who understands the spirit world, the spiritual he says spirit taught words and spiritual realities live in a different space than those who don't. And I think that's pretty remarkable, right? That if we don't look at the world through spiritual lenses, then we actually miss the whole nature of what Christian spirituality is about, right? That, that it, at its core, it's about a loving engagement with our creator and all that that means, and that guidance towards a life of fullness in Christ. And so for those who don't follow that same paradigm, they look at us, as Paul says here, with with eyes of foolishness. They think, "Why, why would you value the things you value? Why would you live the way you live? It just doesn't make sense to them as much. So that is, that is an important aspect of this. There's another passage that he talks about in the second letter to Corinth in 2 Corinthians 3.17, where he actually connects our kind of contemplative life with this transformative transcendence that we're trying to um, aspire to. Did you read that one, Hannah? This passage says, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So we talked about this in episode one, I believe, when we were talking about the role of contemplation. But here there's a direct connection with our kind of intimate practice of being in the presence of God that directly connects us to a transformative life with ever-increasing glory. So the idea is that we're becoming more the way God intended us to become, the image of Christ. But it happens through this internal life that um, he talks here about contemplating the Lord's glory. So I think think that kind of helps us with some general framework. Now, when we talk about Christian spirituality, 
again, we we have to begin with where the most important where the most important commands, the most important entry points, what matters more than anything else. You know, sometimes people mistakenly think that everything in the Bible is equally relevant. It's not, right? Even Jesus was asked when he was talked to by the experts of the law, you know, they wanted to know, they asked the question, teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And the reason they asked the question is they recognize that everything is not equal. Mm -hmm that there are some things that really take precedent as umbrellas or kind of overriding principles that guide everything else. And um, in Matthew 22, you know, we know this passage well, but Hannah, could you remind us of how Jesus responded to that question, what's mm. the greatest commandment of the law? Yeah, Jesus replies, um, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You must love your neighbor as you love yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. So if this is the governing scripture, and Jesus is addressing our whole sense of being in this world through this concept that's called our anthropology, how we view ourselves as human beings, he talks about our wholeness here, that every part of us has to be caught up in this idea. It's our heart, our soul, our strength, our mind, our being. You know, we have a lot of ways of talking about the different aspects of our humanness, our psyche, our spirit, our head, our heart, our hands. You know, we have different ways of framing our anthropology. But what Jesus is basically saying is everything about your sense of being in the world should ultimately be about loving God and loving people. That is what you are created for. Everything else depends on that. In other words, this comes first and we interpret everything through it. Now, this ties us back to a concept we addressed in our last episode about hermeneutics. And I think this is a concept we'll need to repeat and talk a lot about to really gain understanding about it. But this idea of hermeneutics, and I know you come across this as a, as a literature scholar, I'm sure you come across it as a theology student now too. How would you describe hermeneutics, that word? Well, is it basically just how we interpret, how we interpret texts or, or anything, really? That's, that's right. So how we interpret a text, like scripture text, would be a hermeneutic. Um, but you're right when you say about anything. I mean, how we interpret an experience, how we interpret a relationship, how we interpret a conversation, we would call that a hermeneutical lens. In other words, you know, when we we put on a set of glasses, we see something through that lens. So the question for us here is, what hermeneutical lens do we wear as an entry point to understanding the story and how it shapes our spirituality if we really believe what Jesus said, that ultimately everything's about loving God and loving people? So if love becomes our hermeneutical lens, this principle uh, of interpretation, it restricts and it colors the way we read other texts in the Bible, right? So ultimately, everything has to radiate from loving God and loving people. And I think when, when Christians lose sight of that, that that's the ultimate command, then it, it Christianity really loses its way, and I mean, we've we've witnessed now for two thousand years Christianity losing its way in all kinds of various times and places. I know we talked last time. You asked the question, you know, if we go garden to garden, why is life so complicated? And we we talked about Israel constantly losing its way. It's not just true of Israel. I mean, Israel lost its way over and over. That's the story of the Old Testament. Israel loses its way. God continues to pursue. God's grace is always there to bring them back into the life that he was calling them to. I would certainly would say that's true of 2,000 years of Christian history. God is always there. He's always present, calling us back into this life of love, and, and we continue to lose our way. Um, and I think we could probably talk about that in all kinds of ways. Maybe you could articulate a few. Have you ever seen, have you seen Christianity <laughs> lose its way oh, ever, that's Hannah? Oh, podcast. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I've just taken a black liberation theology class last semester and even seeing the way 
slavery was even um, justified by Christians or certain use or misuse or erasure of scripture and uh, and Christianity was used to enforce subservience in that way and um, just to justify horrific acts throughout history. And of course, I'm British as well. So there's that, the colonialism, <laughs> seeing the way um, bringing the gospel to other nations was kind of a guise for domination and even enforcing culture more than even the gospel, which can still happen today. So definitely seeing the way in which not having that hermeneutical lens of love um, through which people to, to look through um, has really tainted Christianity as a whole and I think led to people's disenchantment actually with it. Yeah, those are some great examples. And you're right, it continues to happen over and over and over again. It, it takes different forms. The example of slavery is a powerful one. And I think it also shows the power of God's normative scriptural text that's this guiding principle that eventually continues to shape mankind. I mean, slavery has existed within Christianity for nearly its entirety of its history. What's fascinating now is that no Christians that I know now would ever justify slavery. And 200 years ago, Christians were still justifying slavery. So after 1,800 years of the Bible's existence and Christianity's presence in the world, we still were justifying slavery. And the power of the gospel continues to work through time to shape our view of loving God and loving people. And we're catching things even now that we didn't, you know, that we didn't fully embrace earlier on. So that's a great example. I love that you brought that up. But yeah, the marred history of Christianity, I mean, you can look at all kinds of examples of extremism, fundamentalism, judgmentalism, um, and, and all kinds of other isms that, that have taken over. And, and today we see it play out in a lot of um, Christian cultures by self-righteousness, um, a lot of toxicity and bad behavior come about when we misinterpret love as not the guiding principle. We see a lot of control in churches. We see arrogance in church leaders around the world um, when somehow, even celebrity culture, that somehow church leaders now can end up positioning themselves to be over uh, other Christians or better than other Christians. And so, again, it's, we, we have to go back to, we have to go back to, we have to go back to. So scripture is so important as the guiding principle for our spirituality. And I, I think going back to the Gospels and what we were called to as Christians, we probably have to constantly go back and revisit. So you remember John the Baptist, his message when he came as he started his ministry, he had a message that Jesus ended up paralleling that talks about the overall encompassing spirituality and the call to a different spirituality. So Matthew 3, um, Hannah, I know this is a passage we're familiar with, but reading, if you could read these verses one to three for us, I think it frames the importance of what Jesus and John the Baptist were doing with this call to an overarching new way of thinking. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So John the Baptist was preparing the way. He was trying to prepare the hearts for Jesus' coming, but he uses this word repent. And he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. There's, there's something coming. It's big. It's important. And he's, that this command, repent, is laid out. How have you historically been taught to think about that word, repent? I've always heard it be taught as kind of this mind change going back to the, the Greek words meta and noia, kind of a uh, change of thinking, I guess, or doing a 180. Doing a 180, yeah. Yeah, so it is, it is a mind change. It, it's, a, it's an overall way of reframing the way you see the world. Now, I think when we don't understand the big picture of metanoia, so meta being beyond or transcending more comprehensive, that's, 
that's the Greek here, with the word new or mind. So what Jesus is calling us to is this idea, or Jesus and, sorry here, John the Baptist, be of a bigger, more comprehensive mind. Embrace a way of seeing the world that transcends the way you see it now. When we don't take that whole thing into account, what happens is we look at the 180 degree turn as a moral change. And only a moral change. Oh, stop acting badly and start acting better. But it's more than that. It's change everything about the way you see the world. And in that, you will have a moral change. But the conversion process is bigger than that. And he even goes on and he explains the implication of how we change our whole way of thinking about the world, seeing the world, engaging the world, and how it changes the way we live within the world in just the next couple verses in verses 8 and 9. Mm. Can you read those? Yeah, it says, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. So John is saying, as you are changing your big picture way of thinking, produce fruit. In other words, he's saying this more comprehensive mind of yours, this new way of engaging the world, will actually change the way you live. It will show in the fruit of your life. So it's not just about something happening in our head. It's something happening in how we live. So again, theology, how we think. Spirituality, how we live. And remember Jesus' almost identical message in Matthew 4, 17? What did Jesus say there? From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near, right? Back to repentance. Exactly. So again, Jesus is saying, change the way you think. The kingdom of heaven is coming. This is different. So Jesus is tilling up the soil. John the Baptist was tilling up the soil. And the primary message that was coming was about a way of living in the world that would be different than he calls the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Um, so when we talk about the kingdom of God, he, that's why most of his message in Jesus' teachings were about the kingdom. The kingdom, in understanding this way of thinking differently, shapes everything else. So we see all kinds of analogies with this when he's trying to paint these pictures, these images. The kingdom will be inhabited by the poor in spirit and those who are persecuted. The kingdom will be something that we should seek as primary in our life. The kingdom's like a mustard seed that grows but becomes the largest plant in the garden. The kingdom is something that should be so treasured that we're willing to give up everything for it. So even when the spiritual leaders of the day and those that had power and influence uh, in that day, in the religious contexts, came and started questioning Jesus, he even responded pretty strongly by saying, God's kingdom will be taken away from you and will be given to a people that produce its fruit. And what's so powerful about that concept, that statement, is Jesus is saying your understanding of this way of thinking of the world is wrong. It's toxic. And those, those leaders would eventually be dislocated and the fruit of the kingdom would come to fruition. And, and I think regardless of the time period you look in history, we see that happen over and over and over and over and over and over again. When we have these bad iterations of living out our spirituality, when people misinterpret, when it's not about loving God and loving people, that it always eventually gets uprooted. It always ends. It always finds, you know, a time in its life or an end to its life, that version mm -hmm. of it. So that's a daunting, powerful right. image. It's reassuring too. <laughs> but I can't imagine saying something like that to leaders today. I think that would be. So what do you mean by that? You can't imagine saying something. You mean oh, to Jesus say what Jesus said. just yeah, said? Yeah, I think people will be shocked that are to hear that the idea of, yeah, it's the power will be taken away and given to someone. Or the kingdom of God will be taken away and given to someone that produces its fruit. I think that's a really radical statement. 
Well, that's the, and I, I think you're right about the hope that that produces. There's no such thing as spiritual leadership that will not have to face some sort of judgment, mm. right? It will eventually end. If, if bad leadership, toxic leadership, God, God makes sure that it gets reconciled at mm. some level. And I think that does produce hope for people who feel like they're in difficult situations. Um, but there's a right accountability that we all have to face, that if we don't properly represent God's will, and if we aren't about what God's wanting us to be about, that eventually our influence will be limited. <laughs> <laughs> right? So maybe as we kind of wrap up this um, this episode, we can, we can talk about some of the ways that spirituality can give language to, or when we talk about spirituality, what are the things it gives language to? So if it's this way of being in the world, there's a lot of things that shape that. I mean, my guess is, Hannah, with your experience growing up in the family that you did, in the religious context that you did, in the country that you did, at the schools that you went to, those things all shape your spirituality. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Right? So when you meet people at Harvard now, you're going to school in Boston, and you are engaging students from all other places in the world, how they come into their understanding of their own spirituality has been formed and shaped not only by their theological tradition, but the country that they lived in, the context in which they grew up in, the culture in which they experienced. Mm -hmm. So maybe in kind of summarizing what spirituality can mean, as you said earlier, it, it kind of encompasses everything. It really does. It can give language and understanding to a lot of different dimensions of our spiritual life. So certainly it's our way of being in the world. We understand that our context, our history, our culture, even our own personal identity are shaped by or shape our spirituality. Our worldview, as Jesus calls us to this kingdom of God, you know, way of seeing the world. So it shapes our worldview, which then shapes our purpose. It shapes a sense of meaning. What are we here for? Um, I like to talk now a lot about postures, spiritual postures. How do we posture ourselves? How do we posture ourselves with one another? How do we posture ourselves with God? Um, one of the things that I think we're going to find a lot here in the next three years on this podcast is the language of journey. So this gives language to the idea of the journey. What does the spiritual journey look like? And as you brought up, when you're traveling, if we use the garden to garden analogy on the journey, there are times on the mountaintop, there are times in the desert, there's times in the wilderness, there's times on the plains and the flatlands, sometimes we're passing over the seas. So this idea of journey adds all these different elements to our spirituality that it is this constant process. So when we think about the desert times, the wilderness, there's language that sometimes is given to that, dark nights of the soul, the struggle. Um, so we, we think about that, that, and that all ties into our spirituality. One of the big conversations today is about spiritual formation, right? How do we practice spiritual practices, or how do we engage spiritual practices that place us into the grace of God in a way that transform us? That's certainly an aspect of our spirituality as well. So disciplines, practices, how we worship. Um, so I, I do think that spirituality, as you said, gives a lot of this language. So when we talk about this way of being in the world, that's a lot of what we want to talk about. Our intimacy with God, how we wrestle with God, our discipleship, um, our, contemplate, our contemplative life. Basically, the spiritual life is way more than just rules and morals and regulations. The spiritual life is about all of it. How we love God and how we love one another. So this is a really rich definition, I guess, of spirituality. There's a lot in there. Um, I'm wondering if maybe 
ways in which I've used the word even in the past are still correct. You know, when you describe people as, oh, that person's spiritual or more spiritual than, than another, um, how, what might that look like then, Dave, if we're all spiritual beings and um, all these things encompass our spirituality, what might it look like to be more spiritual than we are or to grow, I guess, in our spirituality? Yeah, that's interesting when you use that word. Yes, we're all spiritual beings, but how are some people more spiritual than others? So really what we're talking about there is, are we attending to the spiritual life? As Paul talked about there in Corinthians, are we living engaged with God's presence? Are we actively responding to contemplating, orienting our life? around the presence of God in order to love God and love people. And I think that's really at the heart of what would be someone who is more spiritual, someone who's more attentive to that reality, who's living in that space. Um, how immersed are you in the kingdom of God? How are you allowing it to control, dictate, guide, mentor, shape your life? Um, that's probably the healthier version of someone who's spiritual is someone who's attentive to those things in their life and is shaping their world that way. Well, thank you, Dave, for this framework. I know it's a conversation we're going to continue having. It's such a big topic, spirituality, but I'm grateful for this foundation you've laid. Um, thank you all for joining us on this journey with us. Well, thank you all. You. Thanks, Anna. Thank you for joining this Thread Conversation. We're more than a podcast. Check out threadpodcast.org for more immersive content. Though I'm waiting on here, I get a better view of this boundless world that I